My friends, here's the latest situation for the siege of Bahmut. The Russians are about to take control over two out of three main supply routes. Here you can see the orchestra's progress against the western MSR and here against the northern one. The ultimate objective for the Wagnerians is to link up at Khomove in order to cut off Bahmut's last MSR. Hasta la vista, baby. They're only five to six kilometers before the two tips touch. Never let the tips touch or Ukraine will face a complete encirclement. In the west, Wagnerians have now pushed six and a half kilometers beyond Klishivka and are in the process of capturing this entire forest here. With this position secured and the arrival of heavy Russian reinforcements reported, could indicate an imminent assault on Ivanivske using the cover of this forest. This is a strategic settlement for Ukraine to hold. If the Russians capture it, they will be inching towards that full encirclement. On this team, we fight for that itch. Now, as for Bahmud proper, the city is getting the Grozny skincare treatment. As you can hear, the cannonade doesn't stop even at the center of Bahmut. Ukrainian units are constantly shelled by the Russian artillery, which makes it very hard for them to maneuver. On the 21st of January, the orchestra pushed out of the city's landfill and reached the Bahmutka River, making new gains inside the southern districts of Bahmut towards Trotskyye Provlok Street. By February 4th, the musicians expanded once again on the southern part of Bahmut, with this video being recorded as proof that they now hold the neighborhood. Whoa, 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 whoa. King in the castle, king in the castle. And by February 5th, they reached the Bahmut Cemetery and the first buildings of the Sobachivka district. This gigantic urban battle requires the attacker to fight for each street, each building, each floor, one by one. Here you can see five Ukrainian soldiers with the new green armbands firing at the neighboring house occupied by Russian troops. Not too far away, the comrades are also engaging the enemy. As for the Russians, the only way to deal with those positions is to fire at close range with grenade launchers or rockets. Others get creative. They use heavier weapons like the ZU-23 anti-aircraft autocannon. They just fire using a thermal imager. And yeah, the shades are back. I'll be back. Then Wagner PMC captured the Art Winery factory and took control of the high-rise building south of the Siniat plant. The same ones I showed you in my previous video getting shelled by some Russian TOS ones. For many weeks, the Ukrainians managed to hold off the Russians along this street on the east side of the city. But by January 31st, it all collapsed. Wagner salt units pushed almost one kilometer into the residential sector and are now 1,500 meters away from the city center. Here's a Ukrainian squad, seven on one side of the road, three on the other, clearly fighting in a residential sector. You can see them engage the enemy at close range as they're supported by an armored vehicle. But you can sense that their battle is not going as expected since they're completely exposed in the middle of the street. As of February 1st, Wagner forces to control over the ALC Sinyat gypsum mine. We're doing a full circle now further north. On the 24th of January, the Wagnerians also pushed down from Pidharodne and towards the Bakhmutska River. As you can see, the Ukrainians are slowly getting squeezed out of the east bank of Bakhmut. However, that's not the worst. On the same day, the Russians also established a breachhead over the Bakhmutka River at Paraskovivka, only one kilometer away from this vital intersection. Here's a short video of a Ukrainian unit leaving this intersection on foot. They say, it's hell on earth. In half an hour, we lost four wounded and two KIA. We left in small groups. Here are the only ones that are left from our squad. This maneuver essentially turned the defense of Krasnaora into a salient. Added to the fact that the Ukrainians have to cross a river to supply their comrades, the Russians have a clear line of sight on any vehicle or unit going in and out of the village meaning this position is very exposed. The Ukrainians there are fighting heroically. For days they were left with barely any supplies and they still hold. But the question remains, for how long? As the Russians have now cornered and forced the Ukrainians into a semi-encirclement at Krasnaora, Ukrainian artillery is trying to halt and target any incoming Russian reinforcements. As of February 4th, Wagner recon units penetrated so deep that they're trying to reach this Ukrainian G point, this gravity point, from two directions. And the defenders are now shaking. 
The Spencer maneuver opens the road for Wagner assault units to strike directly into the district of Stupka, north of Bakhmut. In this one video titled, Every Time Like the Last, another Ukrainian unit is seen withdrawing on its own from the front, across a city now turned to rubble. These Ukrainians are saying that they're walking in ruins. There's no more city, no more Bakhmut left to defend. They're also worried and talking about the dogs left without shelter and that they want to evacuate them as well. In the end, the older one says, that's all, see you in Kiev. Here's an unlucky M109A5 self-propelled howitzer donated by Latvia, which became one of the latest victims of the Russian Lancet kamikaze drones. The situation is so bad there that even the Estonian commander of the intelligence center believes that in the coming weeks, the armed forces of Ukraine will probably withdraw from Bakhmut. Meanwhile, Zelensky says that Bakhmut will be defended at all costs. To which Yevgeny Prigozhin replied, do not retreat from Bakhmut. This battle is the main event of this war. You must fight on because Ukrainian people will not forgive you for surrendering Bakhmut to a private military structure. Resist and fight to the end. Welcome to History Legends. Here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. Remember that if you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, just like with many other commentators, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. Voledar, a field too far. Now things are not all sunshine and rainbows. For Russia, their attack on the Zaporozhye front came to an abrupt halt. And in the end, what happened is Option 3. Could it be a diversion? A breakthrough in this area would allow the Russians to bypass the Bulidar Marinka deadlock. However, my mistake, instead of attacking against Velika and Novosilka like I thought, the Russians actually tried to storm Vuledar. Let's rewind. Around the 23rd of January, the Russian 155th Marine Brigade from the Pacific launched an attack on the 72nd Ukrainian Brigade by capturing Vuledar. The goal for Russia was to push north and flank the stubborn Ukrainian defenders in Marinka. For this attack, a significant force was assembled. Here you can see an assembly area of 10 BMPs right before the assault. The Marines of the 155th Marine Brigade advanced in open terrain in the direction of Vuledar. Here you can even see the beginning of the assault on the city from a first-person perspective, with Vuledar on fire in the background. At the same time, tanks of the 36th Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade supported the attack of the Marines. However, the attack didn't go as planned. From high-rise buildings, Ukrainian troops had a clear line of sight on the enemy progressing in open terrain. Here's what remains of a Russian column. Five out of six BMPs destroyed or damaged. The last remaining armored vehicle pulls back with the surviving infantry. And in this one, an FPV drone with an RPG-7 attached to it headed straight towards a Russian BMP. It's like a cheap version of a kamikaze drone. Now, if these Russian losses in equipment are quite heavy, it all depends if the Russians can hold the ground. In this case, the Russians will be able to retrieve all the damaged and destroyed vehicles and attempt to repair them. In the end, the 72nd Brigade of the Armed Forces of Ukraine held its ground, and after getting reinforcements, they counterattacked, which forced the Russians out of the city. By January 30, the Russians bypassed Valedar and captured a set of heights, opening the way to the mines located north of the city. After a lot of back and forth, the battle turned into positional warfare. And by the 3rd of February, Rybar reported in the Vuledar sector, it was not possible to achieve success. The Ukrainians transferred reserves. The bypass of the city from the eastern side failed. So as you can see, the Ukrainian army is not finished. The Siversk pocket, a new dangerous salient is forming north of Bakhmut, centered on Siversk. On the 28th of January, Russian assault units took control of Blahodatne, which was certified with this footage. This was a real failure for Ukraine, as it allowed the Russians to establish an important bridgehead on the Bakhmutka River. In this video, a Wagnerian explains how their guys swam across the frozen river, despite frostbitten limbs. The soldiers maintained their positions until reinforcements arrived. The Russian forces immediately pushed their advantage south towards Paraskovivka. Here you can see Ukrainian artillery targeting Russian infantry taking cover in a forest in this area. The orchestra is also attacking a new line of defense that the Ukrainians have established west of Salidar, centered on these set of heights. 
you can see the extent of the trench lines due to the lack of natural cover for the Ukrainian infantry, which the Russians wasted no time in bombarding. But according to the latest news, it seems the Russians broke through west of Blahodatne. They even took control of these heights overlooking Paraskovivka and are now only three kilometers away from cutting off the highway. I'm not saying anything, but check this out. Then they can aim to complete the operational encirclement of Bakhmut by swinging south towards the MO3 highway and capturing the towns of Krasnaora, Paraskovivka, and Yahidne. On the 31st, Wagnerians captured the village of Sako i Vansetti. Now let's be honest, it's not really a village, it's more a farm named after two Italian anarchists. On February 2nd, Wagner kept pressing its advantage and stormed Mikolaevka. And once again, here's footage proving that they indeed control the settlement. I don't know why, but it seems that in the past few days, Wagner was pumped on some trend. Because Wagner is also attacking westwards towards Vasyukivka, a village held by the 10th Ukrainian Mountain Brigade. Now let's be honest, this is a very interesting maneuver. If successful, they can use it to flank the newly established Ukrainian line of defense west of the river. But depending on how many troops Wagner has available, I don't have this data, but the orchestra could also push along this valley towards Bandarne, Nikiforivka, and then Kalenki. In that case, the objective would be to cut off the last remaining supply route of the Siversk grouping especially if coupled with a Russian counterattack at Krimina. The Kremlin unleashes Krimina. For about three months, the 80th and 95th Air Assault Brigades and the 71st Jäger Brigade, three elite Ukraine formations supported by Special Forces and National Guard units, have tried to infiltrate and capture the strategic city of Krimina by attacking through the dense forest, knowing that this terrain would be unsuitable for Russia's large mechanized formations and would also provide them with cover from Russian drones and artillery strikes. So this is a very sound maneuver for Ukraine. The only problem is due to this threat. The Russians brought massive reinforcements to the sector, namely four divisions, four entire divisions. The 154th Guards Motorized Rifle Division, the 76th Guards Air Assault Division, the 7th Guards Mountain Air Assault Division, and the 90th Tank Division. With roughly 15,000 men per division, that means they massed 60,000 soldiers in this sector against maybe 20,000 Ukrainians. The Russians have as many soldiers in Krimina alone as all of Germany's ground forces. Now, according to the reports, the main line was held by the 144th and the 76th divisions, with the 7th and 90th divisions in reserve. Here's how a Russian division holds a 20-kilometer front. This diagram might seem very complex, but if you break it down into battalions, and for those that understand football formations, well, it's actually a 4-4-3, which shows a defense in depth. Now, up until the 26th and 27th of January, there were many reports of massive Ukrainian assaults against Krimina. In one area, a report mentions an attack by six company-sized tactical groups with the support of combat vehicles from three sides. They would advance as close to enemy positions aboard these M113 APCs and dismount at the last minute. In the middle of snow, Russian mortars would unleash on advancing Ukrainian units, especially the ones exposed in the open. Fighting took place at less than 100 meters, basically at football field range, with limited knowledge of what's happening on your left or right. Here are some Russian defenders firing a machine gun from their small isolated firing positions. However, on some occasions, when the terrain allows it, armored vehicles can actually intervene, like this BMP-2 and T-72 providing suppressive fire for the infantrymen in the foxholes. Here you can see a video from the same paratroopers of the 76th Division, defending their position with the support of a tank, and firing grenades and rockets at the enemy from a distance. Same thing for Russian Ka-52 helicopters and their anti-tank guided missiles. I mentioned it for many months, but forested areas was the favorite terrain for the Ukrainian infantry because Russia didn't have enough men to actually cover the entire front line. But everything has changed since the mobilized personnel arrived and every meter was now manned by a Russian soldier, which basically stopped any infiltration methods of the Ukrainian DRGs. In the end, the 154th Division held its ground and repulsed each one of these attacks. 
All I know is that the Russian public seems to particularly like this division, especially the commander nicknamed Metis of the 254th Regiment, because apparently he went directly to the front line to make sure that his men hold the ground. And then some artists made a bunch of artwork about this event. Similarly, some VDV paratroopers were engaged by some Ukrainian armored vehicles before being rescued by friendly IFVs. Now here's the perspective of the armored vehicles that came in support. Anyway, now that I know the balance of power, I'm not surprised that the Ukrainian assaults have not been successful. It's more curious as to why these attacks were even launched with such a disfavorable balance of power. The Russians patiently waited for the Ukrainians to tire themselves out and exhaust their resources before launching their own counter-offensive. They launched an attack in the woods southwest of Dibrova against a unit of the territorial defense. But the real attack started on February 2nd, with this push towards Nevsky, Terny, Yampolovka, and Torske. At the same time, for the north, the 3rd Motorized Division is advancing against Bakivka. So as you can see, objective one of this Russian offensive is this line right here, up until this sort of lake. After that, step two would be to push all the way up to the Oskol River and reconquer the city of Liman, which sits at the doorstep of the important city of Slavyansk, where the entire war in Donbass started. The goal of this maneuver is to eliminate the Ukrainian salient at Siversk. As Wagner assault units continue to push north, along this river and west to finish off the encirclement. Of course, there will come a time where the Ukraine command will have no other choice but to pull back these men. And to me, this is the entire problem of Ukraine's strategy. They convince their population and their army that everything is going well. So any tactical withdrawal would be seen as a much greater defeat than it actually is. And this rigidity might be very lethal for the Ukraine armed forces. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description.